Hello, everybody. So it is a great pleasure to make this presentation today, um, where we will be talking about advanced uh, techniques for online advertisement and spend optimization. So before we start, uh, we will let you know who we are. So my name is Nathan Kaffee, uh, Principal Data Scientist at uh, GSK Consumer Healthcare, so leading sales and marketing uh, data science projects. So prior to GSK, I worked at Groupon for more than five years. I will let Bruno introduce himself. Hello, everyone. Really nice to be here with you today. I'm a senior data scientist within the team. And I work with recommender system, basically using Bayesian statistics, or reinforcement learning to yield recommendations. And before GSK, I was doing a master's degree at UCL and also worked for a number of organizations, startups and enterprises like NVIDIA. So I hope you enjoy the presentation today. Thank you, Bruno. So now let's talk about the GSK consumer healthcare business. So we are the world's largest consumer healthcare company following our joint venture with Pfizer. So we develop and market um, a portfolio of uh, consumer preferred and experts recommended brands. Um, most now and them are Sensodyne, Advil and Voltaren. So they are one of the most popular consumer healthcare brands. Um, innovation, performance and trust uh, are the heart of our philosophy here at GSK. So now let's talk about the agenda of this uh, presentation. So we will start with the context and why audience optimization is so important for marketers. And then we will talk about Bayesian learning and probabilistic programming and why they are foundational for intelligence based marketing. And then we will take Tonson sampling as one of the most used approaches. And then we will uh, close this uh, session by drawing some conclusions, recommendation, and have a, a Q&A session at the end. So now for the context, one of the most uh, important uh, challenges for the marketers uh, when they start a campaign is to ensure its effectiveness, uh, but with a controlled cost to ensure uh, the campaign efficiency. So during the execution of the campaigns, we need to know what is the best audience to invest in and what is the most relevant creatives for a given audience. So when we start a campaign, basically um, we, we, we define the goal or the objective of the campaign. So some of the campaigns are meant to reach new customers to increase the brand awareness. Some of the other campaigns, they are uh, for, uh, or they are, they are here to help with the sales and increase the conversion rate this basically in this instance the conversion rate is the objective function for this kind of campaign so basically we have different campaigns with different objectives um, now uh, let's discover together the typical hierarchy of uh, our JSK campaigns so basically a brand or an advertiser set or kick off a campaign then we decide to go with a set of audiences or ad groups. And then within each ad groups or audience, we have a set of creatives. So it could be one creative or more than one creative. So basically this is the typical uh, campaigns here at GSK. So basically we got also a lot of uh, data related to each layer or each level. And then all of this data, we will see they will be very useful later to, 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 to run um, like either reporting or any intelligence based marketing systems. Now we will discover together the, the, the data flow for, for our running campaign. So basically uh, we start uh, with um, a campaign manager setting the campaign objectives and then we work with our publicist colleagues uh, to, to, to define the scope of the campaign and allocate the budget. And then the next step is really to run uh, this campaign or execute these campaigns by using some DSP platforms. And then from there, while the campaign is, is executing, we will collect a lot of data from this uh, DSP platforms. And then the outcome of this data, it can be used either for dashboarding purposes or for any uh, intelligence-based uh, marketing system. So uh, that's, that's the, basically the running uh, data flow. And then uh, based on this 
dashboards, we can derive insights and then uh, collect these insights and, and take some decisions in order to make adjustments on, 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 on the ongoing campaign. And then it is uh, really a very active uh, loop during the life cycle of the campaign where we get things updated and recommendation and actions being monitored based on all of this data that we are collecting from, 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 from this data flow, basically. Uh, <clears throat> next, next slide, please. Now, um, yeah, so, so in order to use in, in a consistent way this data, so the classic approach is to build a dashboard or a report is on the data we collect. So basically, we can um, like uh, see the trends and monitor uh, this campaign activity. Um, we can use the dashboard to slice and test the data and build some views on top of it and derive some business insights. But um, this 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 classic way to to monitor campaigns is 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 not really um, scalable and it will not give you a recommendation about the action you should take given the the the, the problem or the the, the, the optimization we, we want to 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 carry on um in 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 in, uh, in a practical example so a campaign manager or a brand manager will run different campaigns in different countries with different um, like uh, brands or, or products. So basically uh, we will have um, like here, for example, we have an, like uh, an example of one campaign running with 11 audiences and um, given uh, a specific time point, uh, we will have to take some, some actions and, 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 and take the optimal decisions when it comes to budget allocation. And also when it comes to uh, which which audience to invest in and and which creative to show to which uh, to which 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 audience, this basically is is it should be done uh, at scale. So basically with a lot of ongoing campaigns, and I think here it becomes very critical to 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 have a recommender system that will assist you to 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 complete this task. Uh, now, uh, the way to see it is it will be it will be uh, seen as a data science application or system that will uh, help you first to collect all of this uh, data from different or multiple DSP platforms, aggregate, consolidate all of this data. And I think this this task of of, of consolidating the data is really critical because uh, it is time consuming, of course. And, and 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 you will need to help really uh, to to take like some some actions very 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 quick and and fast in order to to respect this times lines like time points through time and and make like the decision at the right time without losing a lot of money and and make your system or campaigns monitoring very optimal so basically uh, you will have to observe the data and 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 do these uh, budget recommendations. Uh, on a basis of it could be daily or seven days or be weekly. So that's basically how this uh, data science application will be used and monitored. Um, now, the next uh, part of this presentation, we will talk about uh, Bayesian thinking and, and how and why it is very important for this kind of uh, uh, marketing or online marketing optimization. So I will hand, hand, hand it over to, to Bruno to, 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 to talk about Bayesian thinking. All right, thank you, Nathan. Thanks for the context and introduction. Uh, I want to start by giving a refresh, given the audience we have here. So often in classic approaches, we have, uh, for example, A-B testing, where we have a control group and several variants to test whether something uh, is performing better than the other variants. And what happens in here is that we start collecting data for each one of these variants, and we define hypotheses. So for example, the new hypothesis might be that the variants will not perform better than the control. But one of the challenges with A-B testing is that in certain instances, you may not have enough data to achieve significance. So in the past, I've seen campaigns or you know, uh, variants running for months without getting to a certain degree of significance simply because we didn't have data. And often it is the case that conversion rates can be quite low uh, depending on the products, depending even on the seasonality of your specific group. The same applies to campaigns. We see that certain campaigns, they might naturally attract 
more impressions, more clicks, therefore more conversions, simply because might be brands that people know better. For example, Sansodyne might be better known than Advil in some countries. So here we have the challenge of observing the data and then estimating the parameters like the mean and the variance and etc. But this is not quite efficient. Again, when will you achieve your, your significance levels for that? And how do you frame hypotheses that actually uh, make sense? And how many variants do you have uh, in here? So let's imagine in a different way. Let's tackle this problem as what happens if we have an event A, say that we are collecting some data, and we want to assert what happens to the event under the constraint or under the observation of another event B. More often, uh, the not, we want to calculate the probability of a certain event a, event a happening given we have observed event B. And now I'm going to go a little bit into the basics of probability just for a quick refresher. We know that by the probability uh, definitions, we know that this is the same as the probability A and B divided by probability of event B. Basically what this is saying is that if we have, for example, two events here, A and B, we have an area of, of overlap of them. And we want to calculate the probability of a, a happening given B without counting B twice. So we can work on the algebra here, right? We can work with the basic mathematics and get to this configuration of the equation, uh, which is the basics of conditional probability. All right, so we know that the probability of A and B is the same as the probability of B times the probability of A given B. And we can use like the commutative properties as well. So the probability of A and B is the same as probability of B and A. And therefore, the probability of B and A is the same as uh, the probability of uh, A given probability of B given A. It's the same thing, right? We are just like mirroring uh, the variables here. So let's forget about this middle part for a second. So let's just ignore this. And let's work with this equality here. Uh, of a probability of event A, B times the probability of event A given B equals probability of A, probability of B given A. If we manipulate once more, we can say as well the probability of A given B is the same as probability of A times probability of B given A divided by probability B. And here we find the Bayesian theorem. It's quite simple if you, if you think about this. However, our scenario is a bit more complex than this, right? Because what are we actually estimating in online advertisement campaign? So let's not think about event A and B for now. Let's think that we want to discover the distribution of success, for example, of a given ad group. So instead of B, let's say that we are estimating parameters. Here, let's say that we are trying to estimate the true main or the true variance here or a number of other parameters. This might be like a large vector. And then we just replace, instead of event A, we say we want to estimate the parameters of the data. And this is equals as the probability of seeing these parameters, we call it prior, times the probability of the data we have observed and the parameters we have observed there, divided by the probability of the data. And then when we think about computational methods and reality, you know, it's not that simple. We wish life could be as simple as putting this equation there and calculating. This is really hard to estimate because you have to consider all aspects of this data. And in mathematical terms, this is actually like a, a marginalization an integral uh, with a constant term, of course, and the probability of the data given the observed parameters times the observed parameters, and we integrate this over all parameters. So this can be impossible. We say that this is intractable to calculate. So there must be better ways to do this. And we arrive at this. So if we think about simple terms, we say that we have a probability of a cause given an effect is the same as equal as the probability of the effect given the cause times the cause divided by the effect. So let's simplify it further. Since uh, that equation is really untractable to calculate, and this is not dependent on some of the parameters, we can get rid of that in the classic Bayesian approach. And we say that the posterior that we are trying to find, so this we call the posterior, is proportional, which is a symbol that here we cannot see properly, but looks like a, a small fish if you're not familiar with this, is proportional to the likelihood uh, times uh, the prior knowledge of that. So let's expand a bit further on what I mean by that. As soon as I manage to go to the next slide. There you go. So 
in nature, we observe some likelihoods happening naturally. So for example, if we are giving a go into the classic coin tossing problem, if you're going with a single trial, you know, people have studied that and asserted that Bernoulli is one of the natural uh, likelihoods to choose for that. If you are repeating these experiments, then binomial. If it's something that happens on discrete events over time rates, then Poisson and et cetera. For example, population heights and population uh, uh, statistics are often uh, following a normal distribution. And they're represented with these uh, probabilities uh, notations on the right. But of course, behind that, there are some more complex equations. But here, the takeaway is that the binomial is repetitive trials. Uh, and uh, normal is basically population, organic, for example, the probability of finding someone with a height between a certain range. And then we have the Poisson, which is the count of discrete events. We don't need to reinvent the wheel. So when you start modeling and when you start thinking about the distributions of your clicks or impressions or CPM or whatever that is, you, you can basically find useful resources. You know, this book that I like uh, gives you a decision tree uh, to help you decide which likelihood to choose in your Bayesian model. So for example, here, uh, they consider if it is continuous or discrete, if you have over dispersed data, uh, for example, if you have more than one trial, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't need to reinvent the wheel. So let's think a little bit. So everyone here uh, on this call, let, let's think about how would you model the probability that will flip a fair coin 20 times and get five heads. At Starbucks, there is an average of 1.8 customers per hour. What's the probability of observing four customers in the next hour? And considering the world population, what's the probability of selecting a human being whose height is between 1.75 meter and 1.80 meter? So when we, we face this type of questions, we start thinking, hmm, maybe this is like a normal distribution. Maybe here at Starbucks, we have a Poisson because it's count of discrete events and there is a rate of customers per hour and et cetera. And indeed, that is really the case when we are working with simple likelihoods such as this. Uh, here we have like these online calculators that can help us estimate. And again, uh, you know, we see, for example, the height, the probability of finding, you know, a single point in this distribution is, is, is zero, you know? So we basically find a range of probabilities here. So understanding how to use your likelihoods is crucial as well. Uh, so for example, when we are estimating uh, the rates of, of clicks that comes into a certain campaign, how, how we will model that? What is the best way to do that? If we think that clicks are success over impressions, can we use like a binomial distribution for that? And, and this is the type of questions we start thinking uh, when modeling. So regarding the priors, so remembering the equation, we have the posterior knowledge that we have, the posterior belief is proportional to our likelihood that we have just discussed times a prior. So the prior is like a weight that will adjust your posterior. So, you know, if you have uh, some knowledge about certain audiences and what is the mean conversion rate in that, maybe you can use that to adjust the likelihood and the distribution for your newly observed data. In this case here, I want to highlight uh, the prior, uh, oops, sorry. I want to highlight the prior here because in this example, the assumption was we were confident that this coin was biased. And then as we start flipping the coin, we see that the likelihoods and the posterior belief of this coin being biased converges to around 0.5 here. Maybe that we had like a prior knowledge that this coin might be biased, but as we go and run experiments, we see that the coin might actually not be biased. That's the probability of getting heads and tails are, or tails is 50% uh, here. And one thing that we know is that today's posterior is tomorrow's prior. So the big thing here is reusability of these parameters that we estimate in these distributions as well. So again, very smart people, they spent like, you know, dozens of years and maybe hundreds of years studying these conjugate priors. And for our case, we use Jeffrey's prior. I will explain how in a second, but um, it's basically what I just said. It will give you a posterior with the same functional form when we are talking about conjugate prior. So there are two ways to approach this. There are some natural conjugates, uh, for example, beta binomial is one of them. And using these shortcuts that people have studied in the past is often the best way to go for baselines, maybe not for complex settings, but for establishing baselines. And again, we have extensive literature, even like Wikipedia, if you go there, you can find like 
a lot of information about conjugate priors and then what happens, for example, if you have a likelihood in a certain form and what types of priors you should use for that and how to estimate these priors. Uh, here, for example, an example. Uh, so here we have the two equations. We have the beta binomial. So here we have the binomial and we have a beta distribution here. And when we multiply that, uh, dropping the terms that are not dependent on the parameters that we are observing, we basically have an equation that is of the same functional form as your likelihood, meaning that we can reuse this. So imagine you are coding this and you might as well define a function uh, called beta binomial, let's say, and then you can pass these as parameters alpha and beta, and then you can save these and rerun over and over again. Of course, we don't define these functions because we have very nice software packages for that. But the concept here is whenever you use conjugate priors, you can reuse the same functional form to update your posterior beliefs based on new, uh, newly observed data. Here is another example of how the prior can adjust your posterior belief. So this is like the likelihood, the data we have observed. And maybe like in a previous experiment, let's say two weeks ago, we have observed this. But maybe we didn't have enough data. And this is one of the core advantages of using these Bayesian approaches, is that the posterior is a representation of your belief in the parameters. So even though you have like very little data, you might as well, depending on how it goes, establish some knowledge about the distributions. So here we have, for example, last week, like uh, on the first time period of collection, we have this prior. But then on the following week, we have observed this data. When we multiply them together, we may obtain a new belief about how, for example, uh, impressions might behave for a certain uh, audience. In our case, we were initially between two approaches, beta binomial and normal, normal inverse gamma. And the beta binomial is very, very simple. Uh, it's basically success and failures. Uh, so for example, if we consider impressions as everything that we are presenting to uh, audiences, and if we consider clicks or purchases as success, then we can estimate alpha and beta such as this, alpha being the number of success and beta being the number of failures. And then we assume a Jeffries prior because uh, in a campaign that we are just starting, we may not have any knowledge about this new audience. So say that we are targeting an online advertisement campaign to gamers, but you never did that before. Your target audience used to be motorsports fans. So you don't have any knowledge about how this will behave. So you can initialize with a prior knowledge that doesn't inform uh, anything about your distribution. We'll see uh, a picture that will represent this. Some of the problems that uh, these conjugates may yield is that the success in this case might be much, much lower than the number of failures. Because uh, again, in certain instances, the conversion rate can be very, very small, uh, you know, less than 1% uh, of uh, at times. And then the other one is a more uh, flexible approach, the normal, normal inverse gamma. Uh, the only problem with this is that you have four parameters to work with, and it's a hierarchical model, so you need to uh, think about the parameters of parameters in order to get to a posterior distribution that actually makes sense for your, uh, for your variables. And of course, we consider it an experiment with several other uh, conjugate uh, models and some other models as well, like Markov chain, uh, Monte Carlo methods, but some of these were really, really bad. So we decided to move forward. Here is just to exemplify that it can get very complex. So if you go and try to work the maps yourself, it's kind of, I would risk to say, useless because all these have been studied and you have like books and literature and even packages that have already implemented that. So let's talk a little bit about recommendations and in interpreting uh, these models. So imagine that you are a data scientist or a manager and your data scientist sends you an email such as this. I want to inform that for the audience gamers in campaign central one, two, three, we have a 45 success, 45% 45 success probability and audience musicians 32%. The business team can tell you more about the success means, what success means, but I hope this will help you make decisions regarding the urgent change in budget allocation due today. That's not very useful. That doesn't tell much about how the campaign will perform. It might give you some insights on which audience is better, but I doubt anyone would be willing to drive key decisions involving large budgets uh, based on this. What about the other campaigns and et cetera? So for that, we will go through the Thompson sampling technique. 
which is basically uh, one of the ways that we can implement reinforcement learning uh, and help uh, an agent learn these probability distributions that we have mentioned in Bayesian statistics, learn by itself to yield recommendations. For those who are not familiar with the multi-armed bandit, imagine you are going to a casino and you have many slot machines, and then you don't know which one will give you money, but you try the first one and you lose. Then you move to the next one and you win, and you win again. So should you stay on this one or should you move to the next one? Because it, it's good here, right? Because you're winning, but what if I go to another one and the prices are higher, you know? so. The basic idea here is that the agent, this robot, whatever you want to call it, will explore certain actions, will, will do certain actions and observe the reward. So for example, on this first strategy, the robot played, win, won, won, and then the first time the agent lost, it changed to a different machine and continued on that machine. The other agent, agent was not very lucky. So it was constantly losing. And unfortunately here, by chance, uh, it ended up getting zero rewards. This one here was kind of smart. It tried to explore one machine at a time. This policy of exploration here maybe was not the best strategy, but nonetheless, this one here tried to move around a little bit more and got two. But this last one trying to remain on the same machine and got uh, six rewards out of seven trials. So discovering that is a challenge for the agent. So how, what is the best way to navigate across machines in order to yield uh, the highest rewards? And how do I account for uncertainty on this scenario? So this is the dilemma that many managers and brand managers, they face. So how should I locate the budget, take an action? If the current setting already yields good rewards, so should I really change my budget if I'm kind of happy with the conversions? And maybe there is some fear of missing out. What happens if I don't reallocate the budget? And this is like an ideal scenario for multi-arm bandits because it follows a Markov property in the sense that you have repeated experiments happening at a certain interval. You have a limited resource, in this case, budget that must be allocated among, us, allocated among a set of competing options like campaigns, ad groups, and creatives. So, and again, the rewards are unknown until the action is taken and we need some sort of reinforcement system to account for that. If you're not familiar with reinforcement learning, in simple terms, the simplest terms I can uh, take is football. Imagine you're a player and you never played football and you are in the pitch and you don't know what to do. So you start to just running around and you get the ball and you shoot it outside the pitch. That's not good. So you didn't get any rewards. Next time you try and then you start passing the ball and then suddenly you move around and you make an on goal. That's not a good reward. But then as you play and people tell you how to behave, you start scoring goals. And then basically by experience, you start learning how to make decisions that yield good rewards. So in a nutshell, we have an agent that takes an action in a certain environment, in our case, ad groups, creatives, and their clicks and impressions. The agent will observe the rewards and the state of this environment after an action is taken. So for example, what happens to the whole setting of all clicks, of all impressions across all campaigns when I take this action. And then based on that, the agent will take a further action in the next round until it learns how to do uh, things properly. Before we jump into the code and some more practical examples, uh, I just want to mention that this is like a technique that is commonly used in e-commerce. So Expedia is using it. I, I can share this with you later, but if you Google like Expedia, Medium, Contextual Bandits, you see a very good example of implementation. Spotify also uses it to make recommendations, Lyft. So this is like a technique that is often uh, the way to go as a, not a replacement for a BTS, not a, as an alternative, Per se, because it's a lot more powerful than that. But really, uh, this is the, the entry port for more advanced recommendations when you have settings of massive uncertainty with sparse data, where you, know, you don't really know how to estimate the parameters based on simple dashboard, because you might have weeks or days where your campaign will not really uh, perform for any given reason. So how do you increase your confidence levels and your beliefs about these campaigns across multiple products, across multiple countries, uh, given that the data is arriving every day. So here, let's go a little bit more technical. 
So Thompson sampling, again, is a technique that has been studied in academia and in practical terms as well in the industry. And it's basically one that uh, here in this chart is representing the regrets, how many times the agent uh, did not take the optimum action among all actions. And we can see here that compared to other traditional approaches like greedy approaches or uh, you know, round robin approaches, Thompson sampling really outperforms in terms of regret, it regrets very little. And here, just talking about the algorithm, and it's very simple to implement, we have uh, an empty history. Uh, so for example, the first day of your campaign, you may not have any history at all. And as time passes, we start sampling from these distributions given the parameters that we have. Again, remember that in our case, we might have that a variable is following a binomial distribution with parameters, uh, you know, alpha and beta there, something like this. And then we start sampling for that. At each round, we will get the action that got the highest uh, uh, parameters here. So basically the highest returns. So uh, I will exemplify with a picture in the next slide, but basically imagine that you have probabilities and some are higher than the others. So for example, if you're talking about bias coins, we might be in one coin probability that it's biased 80% and the other probability is 20%. So it will try to select an action that will have the highest probability here. And then we pull all the arms. So that's one of the core differences of Thompson sampling. And then we update uh, the history. Then we take an action. I mean, we take an action based on the arm that yields the, the maximum return here. And then we update the history and then we go to the next time step new data arrives, so we receive new clicks, new impressions, and we keep updating this. Modeling this have some caveats, of course. So for example, some of the assumptions you might make is that all audiences follow the same distribution, for example. And you might say that audiences in a certain settings for a certain product category, for example, respiratory products or um, uh, uh, health products for, for mouth health products, they have like a common mean invariance you can work with these assumptions. But the other one is how often do you want to update your algorithm and how often do you need decisions to be made? So for example, on a daily basis, I don't think this algorithm will be the best thing because you might have some very random things happening there. So it might be the case that you want to update this every week or you might want to update this every uh, two weeks or whenever there is like a massive change uh, in, the, in the mean and the variance of the observed data. So modeling this is really up to, to the scientists working behind this. And here, as I can say, we chose the Jeffries prior. So we carry no information. Uh, it's uninformative. Well, Puris will say that's not really like that, but let's, let's uh, for now, for the sake of simplicity, say that this is no informative. So basically what we're saying is that this audience bleeding gum sufferers, it can be as likely to underperform as outperform but all the audiences are created the same. Whereas if we go to a normal normal inverse gamma setting and we choose as prior knowledge, uh, mean zero and variance one, we might have some information here about the distribution, which might not be ideal. So being sensitive to this type of assumptions in the beginning of your modeling of Thompson sampling is crucial. So here is an animation showing the agent exploring and exploiting. So here we have for one campaign, uh, we have, I think, 11 audiences here. And then uh, as new data arrives, the algorithm starts learning which uh, audience will perform better. Uh, as you can see here, the probability uh, mass function is, is very small sometimes because we are talking here about uh, purchases and conversions over a large sample of observations. So it might be the case that the difference between diabetes to dengivitis audience might be very small. But still, if you can make like a 1% improvement in your budget allocation, it might already mean a couple of thousand, perhaps millions of dollars uh, saved in, in a campaign. And even more if you think about all campaigns running. So here we can clearly see like uh, in the beginning that the algorithm starts with a uniform prior, starts exploring and updating its beliefs for each one of these campaigns. Notice how it didn't exploit uh, the one uh, that it believes that yields the highest returns in the beginning. It will exploit at the later stage when it has a lot of confidence on these uh, ad groups here. So let's see the code real quick. Let me see the time. Yeah, we are just on time. 
So the code, uh, this is like a very simple Thompson implementation just for the sake of exemplifying to all audiences in this conference. So we create a function just to plot the beta distribution. We are using NumPy, SciPy, Panda as a matplotlib. So usually these are uh, at reach of any uh, data scientist, any data analyst as well. And Thompson is very simple. We basically have the initialization. We establish the number of simulations we're going to make, initialize everything with zero, and we instantiate audiences on this. And then we make draws uh, based on the number of simulations we have established from this beta distribution here. So we use SciPy to sample from uh, the beta distribution. Then we also instantiate an audience class here. So we add a name just for the sake of labeling. And then we initialize with Jeffrey's prior. So in this case, alpha and beta parameters are both um, half and half. And then we have an update function that will receive the new parameters here. For now, we ignore mu and sigma. This is from an extract of another code I had. For now, we will be just paying attention to the alpha and beta. So notice here that you have alpha and you add your new alpha to the previous one. And then we run a simulation. So we say that here we are running around 10,000 simulations. And the audiences, mock audiences we have here are data scientists, data engineers, product owners, business executives, interns, and people from outer space. So we initialize these audiences, creating the objects uh, referred here. And then we run the exploration step. The exploration step is basically using the Jeffries prior at this stage because we initialize alpha half and beta half. So basically it's just plotting the first chart that you've seen on the slide. And then the shifts, of course, is basically the budget allocations we want to, to do based on the chosen uh, audiences here. So basically what this algorithm is saying is at every simulation, it is picking one of the actions, one of the audiences yielding the highest return. And it will count how many times uh, a particular audience has been chosen in these simulations here. In practical terms, there are other ways to do this, but just for the sake of example, let's stick to that. So here, because we have a non-informative prior, all audiences have more or less the same probability of success. So here we have around 16% across all, uh, all audience groups in this case. Then we plot the Jefferies using that function, and we see that indeed, uh, we don't have any sort of prior knowledge uh, for this uh, campaign. So this is like a good way to initiate our Thompson sampling and our recommender system. And now one week has passed and we have new observations on this data. So here, very simple, let's say that new observations for the first ad group was uh, five purchases uh, out of uh, five uh, uh, non-purchases here. So 10 observations, five purchased, five did not purchase. The other one, 21 observations, so 13 and eight, et cetera, et cetera. Notice here that we have some audiences with naturally more data points than the others. And that's one of the beauties of this Thompson something algorithm that uh, it will account for the different sizes of the audiences, but still it will be fair in the sense that it is actually building uh, a probability uh, distribution for the audiences. So one of the mistakes in here would be to drive decisions simply based on the average, because clearly you have some audiences here with higher averages than the others. And then, you know, uh, we need to give a little bit of fairness because it might be the case that even though this audience here on the left received uh, less data, it might be the case that this will be the one that will outperform all the others in the long run of this campaign over three months or more. We update this and of course we obtain a new alpha here, for example, uh, for one of the exploration steps. And then we run the simulations again and run the exploration with the new observations, the new likelihood, multiply that by the posterior. And then we have like, again, the new posteriors. And here you can see uh, the mean for the success rate, let's call it success rate for each one of these campaigns. And based on this, we see that uh, I would guess here that perhaps people from outer space is one of the campaigns that is good, but notice how uh, the shape of the distribution is very wide compared to uh, business executives, for example. So here we let the algorithm tell us uh, what to do. And based on these recommendations, and again, we will sample using Thompson sampling and choose the actions that are prone to give the highest returns. And then we have the final recommendation that we can give to the brand managers 
or that we can embed directly into the dashboard that along with the trends, along with the KPIs, we can use to drive decisions. So here we say that product owners is 55%, uh, where 55% of the budget should be. And indeed, if we look into the charts, it is indeed where the uh, main is maximizing here. And then you can follow this. One of the natural questions that may arise from this is whether this actually makes sense and if brand managers will follow it. So just going to the final answer, we compared this to an expert. And basically, the Thompson sampling the algorithm agreed with the expert in budget allocation here. There were some disagreements between the second highest uh, budget allocation. But nonetheless, all the others can, can be uh, more or less on the same range of 7%. But notice how indirect purchases and gaming context, so they totally agreed that they, those were not uh, good audiences to invest in. And the advantage of this is that it can maximize conversions, minimize costs, runs in seconds, reusable and scalable, and it's platform agnostic. So even though Trade Desk and Divit360, they're excellent platforms and we love using them, when you have these settings of multiple countries using multiple platforms, you want to be in control of your data and drive decisions that are best for your organization as well. Uh, here we have a chart just showing the share of costs after the decision has been made. That proves the point that the agent actually yielded very significant and very uh, reliable recommendations as well for this. And I want to jump into the final remarks. Uh, I will open to Q&A later. I can see there are some things in the chat. So Nathan, I'll pass back to you. Thank you, Bruno. Uh, yeah, so as, as a summary, um, it is uh, it, like the, the monitoring of the complaints is often time consuming and uh, precise budget allocation will save you a lot of money if you do it a very, in, in a very good way. Now, um, leveraging Bayesian thinking and probabilistic programming will help you to, to will, will assist you during this decision making process and will help you to, to take the actions or the decisions that we will have to take with, with a certain level of confidence. So basically, this is an advantage compared to the frequency, frequency, frequentist approaches. Uh, Tonson sampling is one of the most used techniques in that domain, along with other advanced techniques uh, where we can talk about contextual bondage. Uh, associated with some um, deep learning techniques that will help you to extract uh, features from both uh, like content and creatives. Uh, especially content creatives could be like text, videos, or, or te like, yes, like images and all sorts of, 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 of content. Uh, now, um, the, 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 the the performance um, like of, of, of this framework, it is like it will go on to your fast decision making. Uh, and, 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 and the good thing about it is that it can be uh, reused for uh, other purposes across the company. So basically you can use it to benchmark, for example, the budget that you will um, allocate between campaigns or even within the same campaigns, which budgets you can allocate uh, for different audiences and even between creative. So basically you can reuse it on every layer of this um, like campaigns uh, hierarchy. And this is, is, is a very um, powerful characteristic, I would say. Um, now some of the books we recommend, so uh, is, is really around like uh, Bayesian statistics, and the reinforcement learning because they are the heart of this uh, online optimizations and performance optimizations. And I think there are still a lot of things to explore uh, when it comes to AI and marketing. So there are a lot of uh, things to do. And I think uh, having uh, this, these two, um, like uh, having a good understanding of these two, two domains like reinforcement learning and based on statistics will, will help you to, to answer the concern of your business partners when it comes to these marketing activities. Um, and, uh, and they want just to, to highlight that uh, we are uh, currently uh, having uh, several open positions. So we are hiring in uh, UK, uh, China, and, and India. 
So please, if, if, if you have any, any interest in one of these positions, please reach out to us. So we have basically uh, several senior data scientist positions, junior data scientist positions, and senior ML engineer positions. So follow us on, on, on Twitter and LinkedIn and get in touch with us to learn more about these opportunities. And, uh, and, and thank you for this, uh, for this session today. And uh, we will go, I think, to this Q&A session right now to answer your questions. Thank you, everyone. Amazing. Th thank you very much, both of you. That was an absolutely fantastic session. Um, crammed absolutely loads of content in, uh, in the time frame as well. So uh, hats off, hats off for that one. It was really, really good. So uh, it's been a few comments in the chat, but I do kind of call this out now. If you've been watching along at home and you enjoyed that, please do give us a little virtual round of applause, please. Um, it is always nice to know that there are so many of you out there uh, watching along with us, which is always, uh, as I say, very much appreciated. Uh, and then we will get into the Q&A. Um, just in terms of that, um, a couple of people have kind of asked about the code and code samples and stuff like that. Um, do you think it would be possible to make that available or is that something that we perhaps, uh, you know, they need to watch back and kind of have a look at the video and see where they go from there? No, yeah, I can make this available. There's nothing confidential on this template and vanilla case that I shared. I may as well share some extra content with the audience as well. Amazing, amazing. Thank you very much. Always nice to ask that. My, our, our audience are often like that, you know, they like something for free. So uh, that, <laughs> thank you for helping. I don't anyway. blame them. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds good. So uh, just as we get into the q and I will definitely call out a few people in the chat. So uh, there's a lot of comments coming in already there. So Andreas, great talk. Uh, Phil Howard, clapping emoji. Tamara, also clapping emoji. Miriam, uh, Daniel Taylor, Andrew, Marvin, Okan, Nicola, uh, Bernard Stewart, uh, all saying thank you with the clapping emoji. I love a virtual round of applause. Eh? What's going to happen when there's actual people clapping? We're, we're not going to know what's, what's happened. But um, uh, Shrikanth, Alexander, Lorna, uh, Paul, excellent. Thank you. Uh, David Fountain, really great presentation. Thanks very much. Um, Neil, uh, really interesting. Thank you for the depth. Uh, so as you can see, both, uh, it's clearly been very well received. So thank, thank you for that. Um, in terms of the Q&A, uh, there are a few that are coming in. Uh, as mentioned, there is the possibility to upvote. Um, I'll kick off uh, just with a couple of quick ones for, for, from my side, and then we'll jump into the Q&A, uh, uh, Bruno and um, Nathan, and go, go from there. Um, in terms of from my side, um, would classical forecasting, uh, like ARIMA, uh, work better for predicting future values? Mm, no, not really. I would say for two reasons. First one, the data is very sparse. You might get uh, lots of zeros in that. Mm -hmm. And the second thing is that this is not a natural thing. So there is a direct action from your budget. So if you shift the budget, it might be the case that the whole setting of your forecast will change based on this budget okay. location. So I wouldn't recommend going with Arima in this case. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, I did see that you were using um, object-oriented programming. Um, you know, what, 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 are there advantages for that? What are the advantages there? Yeah, so this is basically thinking about scalability and productionalizing the code. Mm -hmm. It might be the case, for example, in Trade Desk and other DSPs, we can reuse some of the audience's configs. Mm -hmm. And likewise, in our settings, we might be deploying these into a new uh, brand category or a new product. And then we can store that these parameters for many types of models into these objects instead of saving into a table and a database that might get a little bit confused uh, okay. in, in regards to the time frames as well on the parameters updates. So it's a matter of scalability and coding styles as well. Makes sense. hundred percent, actually. And I, I've, I've been pushing on there about upvoting and taking the top questions but i'm actually going to go to one that's like fourth down there because it kind of carries on the conversation so uh, talking about it there you know with that productionizing mindset uh, question there from eva can, can you tell us a bit more about the tech stack that's been used uh, and how you go about getting this into production yeah very good question so we initiate this with simple Jupyter notebooks for you know prototyping, and then we move to um, a code repository that we set up with test scenarios. So we do run you know tests. We have like requirements file, and this is all sitting in our Azure platform, meaning that the code repo is deployed through MLOps processes defined by the team. Mm -hmm. This MLOps process can also run on Databricks, uh, so we can do some of the adjustments in there. Use for example Spark and query the data directly from the fact tables that the data engineers are preparing. 
And then once that, there is a whole uh, MLOps team that will uh, assert that we have like uh, meaningful test cases. We'll assert, for example, if we have any risk of model degradation, not really the case for us. But in terms of tech stack, in summary, we use uh, Databricks notebooks for that. We use Spark uh, for the data frames manipulations, alongside with some pandas for some of the exploratory data analysis. We use Plotly Express for some of the more dynamic dashboards. And then when we are deploying to production, we use uh, the Azure uh, pipelines uh, to do that automatically. Yeah. Amazing. Th thank you very much. Thank you very much. And it, yeah, it's, it's, it's always super interesting to hear how people actually get this out the door and uh, be, being used in the wild. Um, Looking there, uh, the... one more comment on that. Uh, we also have instances I didn't mention here, but we also have instances now with uh, GPU compute. So one thing that people can have a look at is how to parallelize models with uh, some of these things as well. So that's one of the particularities of, of our cluster as well. Amazing, amazing. So sounds fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we will come to Tamara's question now. So uh, I'm really sorry, Tamara, you were second in the list. But um, yeah, Tamara's uh, basically said that, that thanks a lot. Um, could, could you give me more? Uh, could you give more detail about the agent setup? Uh, what is the reward function? Um, and how are the available actions formulated? Yeah, very good question as well. Thanks, Tamara. So the reward function is basically, it's a double one because we are at the same time trying to minimize the budget uh, spent. So we want to have, for example, uh, CPM uh, reduced, the cost per thousand acquisitions reduced. And we want to also increase impressions. So whenever the agent is thinking about this, it tries to optimize for these two uh, reward functions. So there are, a number of ways you can do that. You can create a single metric to define that. But uh, as long as we have these two variables and the agent uh, observing the distributions that we use both of those, then we have a good reward function. And the second part of the question is how are the available actions uh, formulated? So th this is like a basically how Thompson something works. Um, every single uh, ad group within this campaign is a potential action. So the action here is basically whether you select it uh, to boost or not boost. So this is how we formulate it. So uh, again, uh, let's imagine that these are sockets or things and the action is which one I will boost. In this case, we are taking actions on all of them in all of the ad groups. The difference is the strength of this action and the strength is defined by the amount of budget allocated given the simulations that we run uh, as seen in the code. Amazing. Amazing. Thank, thanks very much. Any, anything to add there, Nathan? Or obviously just jump in as well if, if you have anything to add, please. Yes. Yes, I think uh, this reward uh, like function. So, of course, we can use uh, the, the information that that Bruno has described about uh, like uh, the cost per click and operations, etc. But again, uh, this reward function will differ uh, given the objective of the campaign. So, as I said at the beginning, if we have a campaign that is aiming to to reach maximum of new consumers, of course, uh, the rewarding function for in the in that case is just uh, like give me the, the maximum people that I can reach. And now, if you have, um, if you have, uh, and then for that case, we can think about some Poisson likelihood distribution, etc. Now, if if we come back to to a campaign where we are trying to increase the sales by doing some um, by, by 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 increasing the conversion rate, etc. So then, in that case, the reward function it will be give me the highest conversion rate that I can get, and then we will optimize for that given by blending all of this kind of cost per clicks and promotion, et cetera, that, that, that Bruno has described. Mm, perfect, um, amazing, Th thank you very much, thank you. Um, I'm gonna quickly go back to the chat. I'm conscious of time a little bit, so we'll, we'll fire for you a couple of comments and then we'll aim to perhaps take a couple more questions if that's okay, guys. We do try to keep this to that sort of hour time slot, but we'll, we'll go just slightly over and, uh, and see where we go from there. But just again, back to the, back to the comments there, Jason, uh, Seth, Seth Raman, uh, Rachel, Perty, Dimitra, uh, John, uh, the, the list goes on and on, guys. So uh, clearly really well received. Nor, fantastic session. Massive thanks to Nathan and Bruno uh, for such powerful insights. So thank you very much, Nor, uh, Anna, Carla. Um, as I say, the, the list goes on. So th thank you both very much for that. Um, in terms of the questions, the top two there from Nor and Bettila are more about kind of following up 
um, getting access to some links, getting access to the notebook. So we will follow up with everyone afterwards uh, and do our best to obviously help everyone out with that. Um, I will come to these two questions then um, a little bit more generic uh, fr from Tamara and, and from uh, Nicola there as well. So um, Tamara is just kind of a wider question, I guess, getting a bit of understanding of, of what it's like at, at GSK. But the question there is, uh, are you able to tell us uh, roughly, you know, type, you know, number of ad campaigns that you'll have running at any given moment? Mm, yeah. Can, can we disclose this? OK. Yeah, it's a good uh, question. So it depends. <laughs> In the US, it might be a couple of, of tens of campaigns sometimes running at the same time. It varies from period uh, to period, of course. But globally, depending on the budget we have available, it might as well reach a couple of tens of campaigns, I would say. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, the complexity doesn't lie only in the campaign. Remember Nathan's slide about the architecture. We have within one campaign, several architectures. So sometimes we might have only one campaign with 40 audiences. And these 40 audiences might have, you know, uh, their own creatives and et cetera. So if you think about this pyramid of complexity, it really expands. So it really depends on the brand managers and the campaign managers, how they want to design the campaign as well. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you see only one campaign running, but a lot of budget boosted for a specific objective with several creatives. So it, it really depends. Uh, it, it varies, I would say, from quarter to quarter, but it can reach as well a couple of tens to, you know, uh, a couple of dozens, I would say, between, I think the support of this function would be one to 100 plus, I would say. Yeah, understand, yeah. understand. Um, perfect. I I've been doing my best not to ask any stupid questions, but I've got to that point, I can't stop myself. I, I just have to ask a stupid question at some point uh, in, in a webinar. So um, in terms of obviously what, what you guys are selling, you know, you're running these campaigns and then you know, you may have influence in the real, obviously in the real world as well, you know, m more sales of products through retailers and stuff like that. Are you tracking that information as well? Uh, are you seeing like an uptick in sales, like, you know, in, in different areas? It's not just an online presence that you're tracking. Yes, definitely. I think there is like a public link that can be shared later. It's a use case uh, in India with Trax Computer Vision 2. So it's basically a retail execution case that they developed to understand metrics such as share of shelf and et cetera. And of course, at some point in the future, we might relate the number of sensodynes being sold at pharmacies on the shelf mm. with how effective our campaigns are. Yeah. And there is also a whole team here taking care of marketing mix modeling. Uh, Nathan is also overseeing myself and participating in the project as well. So definitely, we definitely consider uh, several, several data points available both from retail stores, from media spend, from external partners. You know, in that regard, uh, uh, you know, kudos to Publicis and Trade Desk in that regard. They're really good partners, Google as well, and all the others who are here with us. Mm -hmm. And they provide like meaningful data and meaningful sites as well for designing Amazing. these campaigns. Perfect, perfect. Uh, I think we will just uh, start to wrap things up there. As I say, conscious, we've gone kind of five, five minutes over. If we didn't quite get to your question, I, I'm, I'm many, many apologies. And uh, I'm sure we will have the team back from GSK at some point in the future. Uh, but just, as I say, draw, drawing things to a close, uh, thank you all at home or wherever you are in the world for, for joining along. Uh, definitely an absolute great session, clearly very, very well received. And um, I think from my side, actually, both of you, it's been really interesting to actually see another side to GSK. Um, it's really, really interesting to see the whole variety of data challenges that you're working on and clearly working on some very complex challenges, which is awesome. As, as, uh, as mentioned by Nathan there, you know, they, they are hiring. Uh, please, please do take the time to, to check them out. Uh, I'm, I'm potentially being uh, out on a limb, but I'm sure both would be receptive to uh, perhaps a LinkedIn connection or something like that as well. So please do follow up the speakers. Um, and then just to thank you both, um, you know, thank you for taking the time to come and uh, share with our community absolutely fantastic content uh, really really well delivered um, and I, I do mention this every week but it's not just the time you've given up here uh, to come and present uh, there's obviously the time that you have to take to prepare pull the slide deck together think of the use cases so really really do appreciate it from our side so thank you very much and hopefully we'll get to see you back at the data science festival at some point in the future <laughs> And Take likewise, I really enough. appreciate the opportunity. You know, thanks for facilitating the session. Thank you, everyone who attended, and the whole, you know, data science festival team as well. Uh, you know, Rachel, Lizzie, you know, great work uh, on your side as well. So we appreciate it. Behind the scenes, sounds good. Well, thank you very much, both, and uh, we'll catch everyone again very soon. Have a, have a good one, everyone. Take care, right. everyone. Bye bye. bye bye. Have a good day. Bye bye.